Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody out to our online class this morning. Uh, we're going to be doing something a little different this morning. Uh, this is just going to be a one lesson class, and usually I'll break it up into two. So uh, if you like the one lesson uh, in and out kind of classes, uh, feel free to leave comments for me online so I, I know. If you'd like to dig a little deeper and have a, a, a lesson over the course of two lessons, which I like to do because we can get deeper into the subject, let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to hear your input on that. This morning, uh, we're going to be talking about the subject of God builds through builds us through the Word. And um, we got a lot of good verses in here to look at this morning and a lot of good content. So we're going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to take a moment of time to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Uh, just reminding everybody as you pray this morning uh, to keep our church in mind and the work we're doing here. Uh, please pray for us and, uh, and our membership that we might continue to strive to spread the gospel message. And also for uh, our nation as we uh, go about these elections that are coming up on us quick, that he'll give us wisdom, our leadership wisdom, that he'll help us as a nation to make the right choices, the, uh, choices that will honor and glorify him. Um, and that will uh, lead us the way he wants us to go. And I pray uh, also and would ask you as well for those that are still working with the pandemic and dealing with the front lines of that, um, that well, the pandemic, the massive mess that it's been, and then also our frontline workers, whether they're firefighters, nurses, and the list goes on, family, friends, loved ones, the salvation of lost souls. So let's be in prayer for all these things as we go to Lord in a word of prayer. Loving Holy Father, we come before you this day, giving you thanks for this day that you've made, giving you thanks and praise for the life you've provided each one of us through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, who have accepted that. We give you thanks and praise for all that your word says to us, how it guides and directs our lives and teaches us the things we desperately need to know. We give you thanks for the spirit who moves in our lives to educate us, to guide us, to tell us where we should go and what we should do and just be an ever-present uh, a force in our lives to keep us, Lord. We thank you uh, for the church and the work that we've been allowed to do here. We pray that you'll continue to bless us, Lord, and just bless us in any way that you see fit. And Father, we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins and trespasses against you, that you'll strengthen us as we stand before you now. I pray for teaching grace, for guidance of your Holy Spirit, that your spirit might have full course in this lesson. Please be with our nation, our first responders, those who are going to the polls to vote. Lord, give us all wisdom, give us strength, give us health, protection, safety, and watch over us, we pray. And Father, I pray your will be done. I ask now, Father, that this message might go out, that it might reach the heart of those that hear it, and Lord, that it might have an impact in a positive way in their lives, and that you might receive the honor and glory. And I ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, so as I said, the, the name of the lesson this morning is God Builds Us Through the Word. And the uh, kind of the aim of the, the lesson is going to be this. God has provided his word for us to inform us and prepare us for his work. We should be learning his word and learning to comply with his word. And so learning has a lot to do with it. And that's why it's used a lot in there. We have to learn the word and then we have to learn to comply to the word. It shows action on our part. And so if we're not doing that, then we're not benefiting and we're not really allowing God to prepare us for the things he has in store for us, the things he would want us to do. We would not be even be uh, informed of what it is that he wants us to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about the word sanctification uh, because I think this has, and this is going to be sanctification is really going to be the theme of this lesson all the way through because it's really what uh, uh, we, we want to achieve a sanctified price process in our lives. And so God builds us and our lives through the word. This process is known as sanctification. We say we are sanctified by the word. So the key to sanctification is the word. Of course, it is the Holy Spirit actively working in our lives. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Jesus ident identified the sanctification process as he prayed in the garden before he was crucified. In John 17, 17, he said, he prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
And so Jesus was showing us that the process of sanctification is through the word of God and through the truth that is in that word. It's very powerful. And that, that powerful truth is going gonna, is gonna to be what's responsible for uh, touching hearts and lives and bringing about that change that we want, hopefully, and that God wants in us. So we got to dig into this a little bit further. And so we got to understand what is sanctification. Now, some of you would just automatically just know what that is because you've been taught it. But I, I've got a, I did a little deeper look into it. And so sanctification is the action of making or declaring something holy. And so if, if you're going to make it holy, it has to be changed from what it was to what it's now made. And so there's that, there's a process there. So you're seeing a process making or declaring something holy it, and it goes on. In addition, it is the action or process of being freed from sin or purified. Now, this, this action is different than justification. And we're going to talk about justification in just a minute. This is after justification. So we're justified. We're literally purged of our sins through faith in Jesus Christ. We're justified, made, made holy. Uh, and, it, you know, our, our, our soul is made holy when the Holy Spirit takes up uh, residence. And, and we are justified in the eyes of God because what God sees in us as a saved child of God is the shed blood of Jesus Christ for our sakes. Okay. But we're still in our mind and in our flesh sinners. So what this is talking about, the action or process of being freed from sin or purified is the active process of being our lives being moved away from sinful practices and, um, and purified by the word learning what God would have us to do differently, how to think differently than we would do normally by our flesh and nature. And so sanctification is being, we're being set apart. Sanctification is God's will for us. The word sanctification is related to the word saint. Both words have to do with holiness. To sanctify something is to set it apart for special use. To sanctify a person is, it, is to make him holy. So that's what the word does. The word not only makes us holy in our actions, and our behaviors. I was talking to my son-in-law while we were hunting last weekend. I had a great time with him. We had a, a, a pretty lengthy uh, discussion. We were talking a lot about sanctification. And I said, one of the beautiful things about the church is it's a, it's a, it's a institution where a perfect God can bring sinful people in and move them in his spirit by the power of his word to engage their selves in setting their fleshly desires aside and, and actually taking up a process or an action that God would desire them to pick up for his sake and them do it. And that brings God honor and glory. God takes a sinful man, a perfect God takes a sinful man and employs him to do godly things. We wouldn't do that by nature, but that's what sanctification, the results of sanctification look like. We're starting to hear what God wants. We're starting to register it in our hearts. And now we're starting to, to become active as a result of seeing it and hearing it and understanding it. This process of sanctification takes deliberate action on our part. So <laughs> we got to participate. There's got to be something that we engage in. Now, I like the image of the potter and the clay. Um, the potter carefully, and I actually love this picture that I have here because that pot looks beautiful. But I like the image of the potter and the clay because the potter carefully and lovingly molds and shapes the pot and to his desired image. So he's got an image that he's creating. And as it sits out there as a lump of clay and that wheel starts spinning, he begins to mold it and work it and shape it. And then he'll, he'll finish it off. Like it looks like he's doing there, starting to put some final touches on it and just to, to perfect what it is he is, he's going for. Well, likewise, God through his word, leveling molds and shapes the child his child into his desired image. He wants us and he has a plan really and a desired end point for each one of us. He wants us 
to be a certain way, to do a certain thing. And it might be a little different than my pastor. It might be a little different than my wife or my good friend or, or someone, someone else I know. But it's what he has intended for me, the things he wants me to do, how he wants me to do them for who I am and, and really my position in life, whether it be, you know, in my workplace or whether it be in my home or whether it be in my church, wherever God has a plan for me and he wants to mold me. And, and you know, it's funny because every time I, I know I'm in a place that I need to get maybe, um, you know, one of those, <laughs> something comes up, whether it be online, I'll see a verse and I, and, and it'll just, it'll be that verse. It's always that verse that you know was in there <laughs> and that it somehow made it to the surface. So God could say, Hey, remember this one? Yeah. That's why you got to fix it. So <clears throat> he's, he's always working through his word to teach us what he wants from us and how we should be. Now, here's me doing me. Uh, it's just who I am. It, I had to look. So the Greek word, we just read uh, John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. I looked up the word sanctified in the original language, and it is ha hag <laughs> hagiadzo in the Greek. And it, it's, a, it, it's a, a word that fits right into, in line with what we're saying. It says to make holy purify or consecrate, hallow or reverent. And the idea between the phrase hallow, hallow or reverent or those words is that by bringing the life into focus from a godly perspective, the life will reflect behaviors consistent with hallowed behavior, with a reverent, reverent uh, disposition, whether it be for others or for God. And that is a result of that person becoming more holy or purified or more consecrated. So that's what that word. And I love the, the reason I brought that out is because one word sanctify has all that information behind it in the original language. And I thought it was, it was interesting and needed to be seen. <clears throat> Humanity by nature and birth. They're, they're always wayward <laughs> or rebellious. You know, it's just our natural birth and process. We're a wayward, rebellious people. We are born in sin. And as we grow, we become sinners, not only by nature, but we become sinners by practice. You know, I've, I've got a, uh, I've got a grandson and I watch that little guy and he pulls some, uh, he pulls some pretty clever tricks. And if you let him get away with it, he might start really becoming a rebellious individual and, and, and that's his natural process. You know, he has to be told that that's not acceptable and he has to be taught it's not acceptable because if we didn't tell him he would be out of control, <laughs> he would be out of control. Um, and so, uh, so we're, 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 yeah, we're teaching him. We are. <laughs> Uh, every generation of man has had people who thought they could somehow make themselves uh, or be good enough to restore themselves back to God. There's always people say, well, I'm a good person. The problem is, is that it's uh, by whose standards, by my standards, probably a great person, but it's not my standard that that's in play here. It's God's standard. And so where are you at in your standard with relationship to God's standard? That's a different question. And that one is one we really should be looking at. Still, many are even clueless, lost, or have no plan at all. And so the thing that the word's going to tell them is that God offers forgiveness and restoration. He's going to tell them that they have a problem by his standard. And that's every man, because the Bible says for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. So that's everyone. That's the first thing they're going to find out is that they're, they're not measuring up to God's standard. But God was a loving God, and so he offers forgiveness and restoration. They're going to find that God showed that restoration comes from him. When people accept changes his way, it, uh, only he can make. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, what is that? John 14, 6, somewhere thereabouts. Um, 
And so God is going to be providing the answers that they're going to be needing to know and understand if they will go look and choose to do so. God had a plan for all the ages from, from, uh, eternity past to the glorious future. You know, before the foundations of the world were even laid, God knew. He knew the thing. And he already understood. And you say, then why? Because God wanted to show his love. And he also wanted man, his prime, his, uh, his choice creation, to have a choice. You know? And to choose his love. So I understand that, and I'm happy to report that I've received it, and I was happy the day I did, and I remember it like it was yesterday. His plan is to save mankind and use them as a method and avenue for spreading the glorious gospel. So like I was saying, when we're talking about God builds us up, he wants to build us up in life so that we can do the work that he's called us to do and that we can do it effectively, that we can help so many other people by taking the effort and energy and the words and and, and putting them all together and, and going out into the world and sharing God's word and seeking opportunities, thinking about when one of those opportunities is before us. Because look, as long as we're standing and breathing and, and, and not underground somewhere, God's got work for us. He's got a plan for our, our life. And, and we should be trying to understand what that is. Those people, whoever they are, ourselves included, they would be the proof of the gospel. You ever had someone say, there's something different about your life because God changed it, because God has made a difference in, in the life of that individual, and, and it was noticed. They become the very evidence of the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now we're going to talk about justification to sanctification. The word, just, the word of God justifies, Okay. Now, I don't want to confuse these words. I've already, talked, uh, I've already kind of primed the lesson a little bit with these two words. I don't want to confuse them. They're both very important. The word justified means to demonstrate or prove to be just, right, or valid, to free a human of the guilt and penalty attached to previous sins. So you have to be justified before you can be sanctified. It has to come first because in justification to be able to be right or valid or free of guilt, we have to have the forgiveness brought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ to our lives. And then we also have to have the Holy Spirit indwelling us at that time because the spirit is a very big part of how the word justifies or sanctifies our life is, is the Holy Spirit just actually teaching us. and and helping us to understand and and even convicting our life when we hear the word. So it's a necessary, we want to achieve a state of sanctification. We got to be justified first. John 5, 24 says this. He says, verily, verily, I say, this is actually Jesus speaking. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He who heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, you see, path to everlasting life. That's justification. To demonstrate or prove to be just, right, or valid. You only have an that everlasting life in Christ Jesus if you have been proven to be right, just, or valid. So he is my validation. He is my rightness, my righteousness, and my freedom. By the word of God, or by the word of God, we hear about ourselves from God's perspective. And here's the spoiler. (laughs) It's not good. So we hear about ourselves and uh, we hear about ourselves from God's perspective in the word of God. The word must tear down first so it can build up on a right foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So when, when I first started hearing the Bible words, what happened is I started to see myself and how lacking I was. And it hurts. It hurts to see you're unjust. You're not fit. 
you're, you're, you would not, you would die and go to a devil's hell. And that was hard. And, and then the spirit convicted me. And when the spirit convicted me, I found, I found the desire to go before God and, and ask for his forgiveness and his help. And I prayed that Jesus would save my soul. And he did. So now there was this foundation in me. I had a new foundation. I was a new creature. Now there's something good, solid that can be built, that can be placed there. And it, it, can, it can stand throughout all eternity. So the word brought me there so it could do what it wanted to do with me as my life continued on from that point. It shows us who we really are, where we, where we stand. And, and if we're lost, we stand in judgment. Who God really is what he requires, how we measure up to that, what we need to measure up, who provided for us, and what we have to do to get it. That's what the word does. We must be justified to stand before God. We cannot be sanctified or built up if we are not justified first. So it's important in this message, the word's going to build up your life. It's going to start with your salvation. Okay, it's going to teach you that you need to be saved. It's going to teach you that you need the Lord's shed blood covering as an atonement for your sins. And so it's going to teach you how to do that. And that, I'll tell you, Romans 10, 9 through 13. We just read one, John 5, 24. John 3, 16. There's enough there that, that, that you can learn right from those verses uh, what you need to do to be saved. And then once saved, once justified, we go to sanct sanctific sanctification. So now as we begin to wind this lesson down, we're going to spend just a little bit of time on sanctification and, and the building up and what the scriptures that I pulled together. Um, I had a lot of them. I, I, I didn't get them all, but there's a lot more. This means there's a lot more you can go in and get and, and have fun with, hopefully, and study out for yourself. But we'll start here. With regard to sanctification, the sanctification process or the setting apart for God process, <laughs> which I like to refer to it as the setting apart for God process, Jesus established, establishes a principal truth while he was being tempted by Satan. Uh, and he said this in Matthew 4.4. 4. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So sanctification being set apart is really the process of living. The, I'll give you the principle. Living every word, living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The more effectively we do that, the more we will live a sanctified life. That is a principal truth. When we start to put the word of God in its right place, then we'll be more effective at living a sanctified life. When we, hear the, when we hear the word and we become and we welcome it into our heart, it will produce what it was sown. Oh, it will produce what, what it was sown to produce. And so it's like anything else. When you're planting something, you know, I, matter of fact, I'm going to touch on it right here. You know, you don't plant a, a strawberry seed and get an orange tree. Just the way it is. Now, if you could get a strawberry seed to produce an orange tree? You want to document that. Because there's a lot of people who want to know what that's about, for sure. God's word sown and received produces his desired fruit. If you sow a strawberry and you take care of it, it's going to produce a strawberry. If you sow an orange tree and you take care of it it's, and, and you build it up, it's going to produce oranges. And the, the, the more you build it up, the, the more productive it's going to become. Here's a passage of scripture for us in Matthew 13, 23. It says, but he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, sixtyfold, some 30. So I like that passage of scripture because this was the, this was the right ground. This, this ground was the right ground because of what it says. He that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. And, and which means that's another action on our part. 
he understood it because he made effort to understand it. And the Holy Spirit honored that effort and revealed it to him or her. And it, it was something that was productive <clears throat> as a result. And so it, it was allowed then in that individual individual's life to bring fruit. And it says some 100, some 60, some 30 fold. Everyone's different, right? But it brought forth fruit. And that's, that's because the word is alive and it's powerful and it does what it says it's going to do. Dr. Luke records another important truth that taught us on the subject. Uh, Luke wrote a quote that Jesus made in, in Luke 28 or 11, chapter 11, verse 28. It says, but he said, speaking of Jesus, ye rather Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So a declaration of Jesus was that the person who, who would hear the word of God and, and keep it, they're blessed. And the more they hear it and the more they keep it, the more blessed they are. And that's a significant truth that right there is a promise. Jesus is making a promise here. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Promised. That will be true every time. They are blessed if they keep it because the word of God is living and powerful and will produce everything God said it would. This is why or, uh, this is the avenue God has desired to sanctify the life of the child of God. We are built up and sanctified through the word being hearers of the words and doers of the word. And I could have went to James for that one, had that one pinned down, but that one didn't make it into the outline. Um, continue on the subject of uh, building up. Here's another good passage of scripture. Uh, I'm going to bring up here The Thessalonian church was a young church when the apostle Paul left it to continue his missionary work. So they were young. They were still kind of fragile as a people, meaning that they were youthful babes in Christ. They weren't built up yet. They weren't sanctified and fully set apart. So he's nervous for them, concerned about their welfare and worried that false teachers would come in and pervert their understanding. He sent to see how they were. Upon getting message, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to encourage them to stay strong and anchored to the word of, of truth, which was working in their lives in light of their sufferings. And this is the passage, this is part of the passage. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. But I want you to listen to what he's saying here. He says in verse 13 of this passage, he says, For this cause also... Thank we God without ceasing, because when ye, re when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So you see what's, what this, this thing is saying, or what he's saying to them. Because they received the word as it was God's word and not the words of men, and they applied it to their life, they became followers. They became active doers of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in church capacity. They were doing the things that God wanted them to do out of the church. And it, it, it even came to the point where they suffered at the hands of their own countrymen because of it. They were ridiculed, criticized, persecuted, but they held and they were continuing. And, and, and the reason that they were uh, being persecuted is because they were doing it the right way. And so you can see how that, that word that they had received even in, in, in as little as it was by comparison of what our churches get today and their people, these people were holding the line and, and, and he was thankful for them. And he, he was relieved to know that they were striving. And, and it's not to say they didn't have their problems because churches have their problems, but I mean, it, as a general, they were striving. So that, that was, that was good. And, and the word was, um, the word was responsible and, and of course the Holy spirit. Um, the apostle Paul also taught the church at Ephesus, the action God takes in cleansing and sanctifying his people 
and collectively his churches. So he's going to show them the action that God takes in cleansing and sanctifying his people and collectively his churches. So we're clean by the word. This actually, um, I think, finds its way into to weddings a lot, <laughs> this passage. But it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So you see right there, not only the process, um, but the, the action that, that, that Christ is active in, the work that he's active in, the will that he has with regards to his church, the people of it, to sanctify their lives, to cleanse them, to present them without spot. There's a great deal of love being expressed here. All love. I mean, <clears throat> there's no more perfect form than God's love for us. Um, Cause it, you know, we see the sacrifice and all that he gave up for our sakes. Um, and he, he declared it no greater love hath a man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you right there. He's teaching. He's moving in lives, building them up so that they might stand so that they might follow through with that work he has for them. We are commanded to be active in this effort of sanctification. We need to make every effort to study God's word and make every effort to apply it to our lives. Second Timothy two 15 was one of the first passage scripture I memorized. Um, and I love the passage scripture. It says study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you are studying to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, then you won't be ashamed. You'll have the knowledge. You won't be fooled or deceived either by the naysayers, by the ones that teach false teachings. You won't be confused. Truth is truth. It can be learned. You're confused up until the truth settles in. Once the truth settles in, it dispels the confusion. Because truth is now truth and it's known. So the, the, the more truth we can put in here, the less confusion and the less, um, when I say confusion, God, what do you want me to do? Where should I go? How should I behave? What, 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 what's the thing I should, should, shouldn't do? Uh, and there's things, you know, we all have them. But um, once that truth is there, it works and, and, it, and, it, and it drives that person um, towards the way that God wants them to go, what he wants them to be involved in and how he wants them to be. The word there study in the Greek is spudizo. And it's a very uh, descriptive word. So uh, the spudizo is uh, translated study by the translators. But I really like the actual word because the actual word means to be earnest, to be diligent, to be steadfast. So study earnestly, diligently, steadfastly, to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, which I jumped ahead because I, I, I want to come back to the middle where it says, and that workman will not be ashamed. Okay. So you, that is, that's what's necessary to, to build up a life through the process of sanctification and the spirit, the spirit's our guide. God's word is not empty, but it's full. It is backed by the power of God. The reason it is effective at doing what it says it will do is because it has God's power and guarantee. And, and these verses I give you, three of them. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Think about that. It came... Not only in word only, it came in power. It came in the Holy Ghost. It came in much assurance. That's just one passage. That's good enough, <laughs> you know, but I got more. I got more. Isaiah 55, talking about the power and the authority of the word. Isaiah 55, 11 says this. 
So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not, let me go back. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. There's a promise, and that promise can be validated today. Every time you apply the word, you're, that promise is right behind back in it. The other one, it's right behind back in it. But there's one more. Hebrews 4.12. <laughs> I had to get something in Hebrews. I mean, Hebrews, what a giver that book is. It says this, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yeah, that, that word cut, cut right through me. It pierced me. Um, when I was lost person, I was young. I was young dude then. <laughs> and it pierced me. And I knew the spirit says, you know, and I knew, and I was scared because I was, I was a young guy, but he says, that's okay. It does pierce you and you do know, but it comes with power too. So take that step, son. And I did. And uh, I felt like the spirit of God carried me all the way to the altar. So three very powerful passages of scripture that show us how the word is, what its design is for us. A lot of other things we looked at over the course of this lesson. I've hoped you'd enjoyed it. I'm going to close with this. God's word is not empty talk. It gets things done by the way of those who follow it. God's word saves us. Then it teaches us and trains us to live for him and do his will. God saved and taught his own to do his work. He's still doing it today. God has provided his word for us to prepare us for his work. We should be learning and striving to comply with his word. Because otherwise, we're never going to get where he's trying to get us. So God's at work. We need to be at work too. I'm going to go ahead and close this in a word of prayer. Loving Father, we give you thanks for this day that you've made, for the blessing of it. We thank you for your word, Lord, and, and how blessed we are as a generation to have the ability to look, to look into it <coughs> and uh, study it and just uh, see the truths that you've left there, the promises that you've made, to see the power of it. Feel the power of it, Lord, in our lives. We give you thanks for your mercy and your grace today, for your long-suffering spirit towards us as sinners as we strive to, uh, you know, take a step forward, oftentimes taking steps back in the process. We just pray that you continue to work with us, to teach us by your word, to not give up on us. Lord, help us to be witnesses in the world. Help us to say and do those things that bring you honor and glory more and more each day. And Father, we ask these favors and blessings now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for your time.